thank the organizers for uh, for the invitation. It's very nice to be in Beirut uh, once again, <laughs> although online. So this is a picture that, uh, as I told you a few minutes ago, that was taken, um, I think, five, five or six years ago uh, in Beirut for the conference. And I'm standing with uh, Ahmad El Sufi, uh, who sadly and suddenly passed away a couple of years ago uh, after that, he was always very happy in, uh, in Lebanon. And um, okay, so the work I'm, uh, I'm going to present is joint work one. So maybe we have uh, a problem. Uh, Ring? The voice. The voice, it's not loud. Better uh, like this? If I'm closer? Yeah, it's better. Yeah, but uh, it was cut uh, and then, yeah. Ah, it was cut. Okay, it's not yeah. the, the volume. All right, so um, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, the 3D Gensberg Landau model, which I uh, present. Uh, so we have a domain in R3, uh, an order parameter U, uh, which is complex valued and uh, a, which I take to be a vector, it could be a one form. And the functional is uh, this one. So to go into the details. So the parameters are the external magnetic field and the inverse of the Ginsburg. Sorry, Etienne, but we, we are still having this problem uh, in the sound. I don't know what's happening. Goes and um, stops at some point. Uh, so maybe the connection is not very good. No, maybe. I think the connection is fine. Uh, uh, are you using the, the microphone from the laptop? Yeah. Well, probably you're probably moving something close to it because I guess. Uh, so, maybe, so maybe it's my hand. I don't yeah, know. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah, maybe because maybe. now. Uh, okay. All right, so uh, so I'm going to use my left hand. Maybe it's okay, <laughs> great, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I hope it's going to go in the right direction, even though it's a left hand. Okay, so um, so we're going to take a limit. Uh, well, maybe not take a limit, but uh, take epsilon uh, to be much smaller than one, small, so extreme type two. And um, <clears throat> the applied magnetic field will be a uh, constant uh, in the vertical direction, but that doesn't make any difference. And the strength uh, will depend on epsilon. We'll, we'll study, um, uh, but, but in fact, so I wrote that it should be much smaller than one over epsilon squared because that's the, uh, that's the so-called uh, Abrikosov uh, regime. But, uh, but in fact, it will be much smaller because we're studying the onset of some superconductivity, which is um, for which the applied field is of the order of uh, log epsilon, absolute value of log epsilon, of course. Okay, so for those who don't know the model, but I don't think that many sense. So epsilon scales like a length. Uh, another simple observation is that uh, since the order parameter takes value from p, so the set where it vanishes is numerically uh, should be of co-dimension curve in R three. And uh, one thing which is not as a but it's a fact: uh, the vanishing of u, the order parameter is interesting only if it carries some uh, topological. When epsilon is small, of course, U um, has a high cost, uh, high energetical cost for vanishing. So it will be small, small regions. So because uh, the set where U vanishes is co-dimension two, so you have a curve. And so we expect U to remain small in an epsilon neighborhood of the curve. And uh, Expect also that there will be topological charge on the curves. That means when you uh, go around the curve, uh, let me see if my pointer 
works. Yes, it does. It works, the pointer. You see the pointer yeah. or not? Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, so uh, so when you go around the curve, well, the phase of you should uh, increase by two pi or minus two pi if you turn your head upside down and um, or a multiple of two pi or whatever. Okay, so this, uh, this uh, structure is called a vortex filament. So I recall at the top of the slide the functional, and I have, uh, I have drawn uh, the domain omega uh, with the vortex filament. Sorry for interrupting, Etienne. Maybe you should use again your left hand. <laughs> it is my left hand. <laughs> we still have, we still have a <laughs> problem <laughs> with the sound. my nose now. <laughs> no, we still have this uh, problem. Does everybody have this problem? Yeah. You have this problem? Yes, but well, it's strange because uh, I don't know whether it depends on the end or whatever. But I mean, it's from sometimes as well. At times, the, the, the audio is uh, completely cut, so we don't know, we don't hear you. But well, uh, well, I think you should just go on and. and I think yeah. so. Sorry about that. I don't know where it comes from. No problem. Anyway, so um, so okay, if the vortex filament is drawn here, and you expect that uh, outside of the filament, uh, the modulus of U should be close to one at least. Uh, when, eps when epsilon is small uh, by looking at the function. Okay, so the, the filaments are characterized, well, yeah, it can be seen in, uh, in these quantities, which are the supercurrent. Okay, so the, super uh, the, the blue lines uh, indicate uh, integral uh, lines of the supercurrent, how it circulates around the filament, and the vorticity um, which is the, the curl of the supercurrent. Plus curl U. Um, okay, so it's expected if you if you have this filament to be uh, equal to to be close at least to two pi times the curve gamma. So the curve gamma uh, should be interpreted as as the current. So it's an oriented curve, and what this means is that if you integrate. Uh, the vorticity scalar product uh, vector field, okay, then it should be almost equal to 2 pi, the integral of the vector field on the curve, the circulation of the vector field on the curve. Okay, so uh, this is, and, and the supercurrent, if you write u uh, in Uh, then it's just uh, uh, the modulus of u squared times the gradient of the phase minus a. All right. So as epsilon goes to zero, uh, filaments are the relevant data. Right. So they are like the sharp interface. If you think of the well, so when epsilon goes to zero, then it's minus one and minus one, and uh, in a way is, uh, is determined by the interface. So in, in this case, the interface just shows the filament and, uh, and their degree. So the question is, uh, okay, how many, how many are there? Where are there? And uh, the question we will ask is uh, concerns minimizers of the functional. You could ask the same question for critical points, of course. And, it turns out that um, uh, the energetic uh, influence of the filaments, you have a cost which depends uh, only on epsilon, and of course the location and shape of the filament it does not depend on the other parameters. And you have a gain uh, which does not depend on epsilon but depends on. Uh, And so, and, and the gain increases with the applied field, and you have a critical value of the applied field for which uh, the net, uh, the, the net uh, in both influences amount to, uh, uh, to, to an energetic uh, advantage of having uh, vortices, and the critical value is, um, 
a certain constant, which depends on omega, uh, times uh, log epsilon. Of course, I will be uh, more precise in a moment. Very good. Stop me uh, whenever you like, of course. Huh? Uh, so what is known in 3D? So there, there's lots of works on uh, 2D ginsburg landau model, so I will not... Uh, Still ongoing uh, generalizations and hypothesis. Uh, but in 3D, um, what is known? So the first uh, work uh, was from Christian Wittler, who uh, studied it in, uh, with uh, PD techniques, uh, epsilon modulation, things like that, uh, in 95. And um, Later, by, uh, I, I did some work uh, from a more uh, variational gamma convergence uh, point of view. But uh, this uh, all dealt with a model with no magnetic field. Uh, and, uh, and so you, in the end, you had straight filaments, minimal connection, uh, things like that. Up. So uh, then you had a, um, a work by uh, Amandine Aftalio and Tristan Rivière, who did, uh, so that's interesting, it's a formal analysis, but, but it does include, uh, involve uh, curved filaments and interaction and uh, light field, so it's, uh, it's really the, the real model, but it's, uh, it's formal um, analysis. And, uh, okay, so following uh, Rivière 95, you had um, many uh, works, uh, se several works which uh, follow this uh, PDE uh, type analysis and um, by uh, Bin and Rivière and then uh, Betuel uh, to, to study the critical points. But, uh, so ultimately critical points, minimizing and critical points with no magnetic field. And this um, was uh, for any dimension of the domain. So, so you had not only filaments, but co-dimension two, if you want defects, the analysis of co-dimension two defects. Okay, uh, and then you had work by Albert uh, Bagliardi, which was more in the, in the gamma convergence for studying the gamma convergence for light and sport. And uh, again, dealt with any dimension and co-dimension. So uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, that in fact, you, you look at the model, uh, but okay, the domain is has any dimension and the target is also uh, not necessarily the complex numbers, but it can be R to the D for any uh, dimension D. Okay, so then, um, then uh, what about where you have the magnetic field, right? Uh, so we had a uh, very interesting uh, work by Alama Bronsar Montero, where they first computed uh, first critical field in the case of sport. And uh, I will come back uh, to this uh, later. And then you had work by uh, who um, did the gamma convergence uh, analysis. Derived a limiting uh, vortex filament density uh, for different uh, values of the right? So, in particular, they, they okay, proved that the first critical the value of the first critical field, at least to first order, and in the sort of uh, average sense that I will uh, make. Uh, and then, uh, really, what um, on this uh, question was a recent work so Petol, uh, in Roman in his PhD thesis uh, developed the construction of vortex filament at the level epsilon. So in the previous work I, uh, I mentioned, so you had vortex filaments appearing, but only in the limit. At the epsilon level, you had nothing, but you had some estimates which told you that certain quantities converged to uh, 
uh, two filaments. So here, uh, Roman, what he did was to effectively construct for a given epsilon, small, uh, a set of lines. So there are polygonal lines in, in this case that do approximate the vorticity on the one hand and on the other hand have the right carry the right amount of energy uh, to leading over so it's a it's a sort of very concrete thing so now you you are given a configuration ua and you have a set of uh, filaments associated to it which is nice and then uh, there was uh, this work by uh, contreras gerard i'm not sure if it's 20 or 21 uh, where they do um, a rigorous analysis uh, where the interaction of the filaments are, is taken into so I cannot describe it uh, nicely, but um, it was very inspiring, and I will say more about this in, uh, in a moment. This was with no magnetic field, and um, okay. So uh, let's describe uh, filaments for uh, for minimizers of uh, the Ginsburg interaction channel. So uh, the so you want to so now we think that we think about uh, really computing this first critical field. Uh, how how do you compute it? Uh, so the first observation is that if you minimize the functional under the constraint that the modulus is equal to one, that means you exclude filaments, right? So what is the minimal energy you can have by excluding filaments? So you can uh, you can compute it almost explicitly. So the minimizer will be of the form, uh, will be a pure phase for, uh, for U, right? So which I wrote here. Uh, so epsilon here doesn't come into play anymore because you have this constraint that modulus of U is equal to one. So so the minimizers depend only on uh, on the applied field, and they depend on it in this way. Uh, so here, phi naught and a naught do not depend on epsilon, and the the minimal energy is h e to the squared times a fixed quantity uh, capital J naught. So this is uh, often called a Meissner solution or an approximate Meissner solution, and this uh, will be the, the Meissner energy. Okay, now if uh, if you assume now an a priori bound uh, so which is consistent with uh, the energy of the minimizer, your minimizer will satisfy the bound. And if you take a magnetic field which is not too large, small power of the uh, small power of epsilon uh, Um, then uh, you can rewrite the energy, you can split it. So for any UA satisfying this, uh, uh, you can write its energy as the energy of the Meissner solution, uh, plus another uh, Ginsburg Landau type energy, but where you have set the applied field to be zero. So this depends only on epsilon, not on. So, so if you if you if you like, this is exactly what I said about the energy, the cost of a filament, which does not depend on H sub e. So it would be in this term. That would be the cost of a, where the cost of filaments uh, come into play. And uh, and then you have um, a term which uh, which involves the vorticity. And uh, the vector field uh, B naught. So B naught is the curl of A naught, right? So it depends only on the domain omega, if you like. So it's a characteristic of omega. It's a vector field in omega. And then you have a reminder term, which is uh, which is small. Okay. So what I, what I wrote here. So the the middle term, the blue term, is a ginsburg landau energy with H equal zero. Uh, so it's not for UA, but it's for UA from which you have subtracted, if you know, in a certain way, the Meissner solution. I, but uh, but the result is that the vorticity of U prime A prime is the same as that of UA. Uh, a and uh, B naught. Yes, it's the curve. And in the, the 
scheme I, uh, I mentioned, our epsilon is something very small. Okay, and now uh, what about the uh, what about the filaments? So if you you admit that the vorticity is well approximated by the sum of uh, filaments, and if you admit that uh, the energy cost of a filament is pi log epsilon times So here, understanding as the length of a filament, then you will be able to express this energy in terms only on the filaments. So of course, here in the in this blue term, you know, you don't only uh, you don't only have the energy of the filaments, but you also have their interaction, um, their interaction energy, which I don't dwell upon now, uh, but which is of smaller order with respect to uh, to epsilon. So now I rewrite this identity in terms of these filaments, and uh, I get this uh, this low so corresponding upper bound. Also, first of all, you have the term which does not depend on anything, right? Which is uh, the Meissner term. Then you have this blue term, which is uh, which contains the sum of the lengths of the filament plus some interaction energy term, which well. And then uh, you have the. I write like this. So this means the circulation of B naught on the curve uh, gamma. And um, okay, so you see that now that there is a, the the critical value of H sub E uh, for which you have uh, transition no filaments, many filaments. Uh, appears uh, more clearly. So what will play an important role is uh, this quantity, which I call B not uh, B not star, which is a supremum with respect to curve gamma of uh, the circulation of B not on gamma divided by the length of gamma. Okay, so I, I should uh, I should say here that the test gammas are curves with no boundaries. Uh, inside omega. So it means they are either closed curves or curves which end up on the boundary of omega. Okay, so if you assume that this uh, supremum is attained and attained at a given curve generated in the unit, uh, then uh, you can say the following that if the applied field is a constant times log epsilon. Uh, well, you have different uh, cases. If the constant is smaller than one over um, uh, one over two times the norm of B naught, uh, then filaments are not energetically favorable. Uh, whereas, if this constant is uh, larger, then filaments are favorable, and uh, they are especially favorable if they are near gamma naught, right? So the most favorable filament is gamma naught. And um, okay. so in fact, uh, this is more or less a theorem from uh, uh, where I group uh, results of So the first uh, result is that if um, omega is the unit ball, uh, then the supremum that I wrote uh, is attained and is in fact uniquely attained at uh, for gamma naught equal to the vertical diameter of the ball. Okay. So uh, maybe I'm going to make a little drawing here. So you have B3 and gamma naught is this. So it is the unique maximizer of um, for this uh, ratio. Um, okay. 
you want me to put up uh, this uh, this ratio again maybe so here, this is a this is a okay so when i will say ratio i will mean this um, of gamma or okay. so it's maximized uh, for this uh, vertical parameter the vertical diameter uh, okay now if uh, you take uh, the h sub d to be uh, lambda log epsilon so uh, you take the limit epsilon goes to zero well the vorticity uh, divided by log epsilon no goes to zero if lambda is less than or equal to this and uh, the limit is not zero if lambda is strictly bounded on this so that's, uh, that's nice because you get this critical value and you show that uh, indeed uh, in the presence or not of is linked to this, uh, to this value of the field. Uh, however, it doesn't really tell you that you don't have filaments if you're below this critical value. It just tells you that the number of filaments is much smaller than log epsilon, and it doesn't tell you that you have. Uh, it doesn't tell you what, what happens at uh, the. individual filaments you you get something which is on the density level okay so but at least to live in it tells you that to leading order in the number of vorti of filaments and uh, so the the value of the critical field <coughs> is uh, log epsilon okay but again as i said there, there is still a, a question of how uh, do these uh, vortex filaments all of a sudden, all together, or uh, one at a time, or whatever. And then um, you have more precision on HC1. So, in fact, you have a slightly more precise uh, statement uh, by Carlos uh, Roman, uh, which is by result of his. Uh, uh, so um, he said that in fact um, you you have you have this quantity. So so if you are log log epsilon below the first this then you really have no filaments in the sense that the vorticity not renormalized is a little low. For Okay. In, a, in a certain norm, very weak norm, but uh, uh, okay, so really, if you're a bit away from the critical value, then you have no filament. And, uh, and if you're above by a constant, uh, then you do have filaments. So it's uh, really a more uh, precise notion of, uh, uh, it's more precise regarding the value of the critical field and of the meaning of the critical field. But if you want to go further than that, uh, then what I wrote, uh, energy I wrote, uh, is not sufficient. So you need, uh, if you want to go further than that, you need to take into account the interaction of energy of the vortex Did just that? Well, we did. <laughs> so that's in a big case, as you as you notice, I say twenty one plus. So it's ongoing work in many ways. But okay, this part at least is uh, is well well settled now. So for generic omega, and I will um, make this more precise later. I put generic between quotes because uh, it's not, we didn't actually prove that it was, uh, the condition was verified generically, but uh, at least it's not empty. Uh, so 
uh, what we have is that if if the the applied field is within log log of the Here, here. Yeah, so, if you're within log log of this uh, critical value, then then the number of filaments for a minimizer of the Ginsburg Landau energy is bounded independently of epsilon. So, what do I mean by the number of filaments? means that if you, um, if you take a minimizer, if you do this filament construction of, uh, of Carlos, then the number of filaments is really less. Really bounded independently of epsilon. So in fact, it's still a bit more complicated than that. So if you do this construction of, uh, of Carlos, you will have some uh, large filaments which go from one one end of the boundary to another, and you might have some small noise if you want, but if you remove the noise, you, you only have a finite number of large filaments. Okay. And uh, so, so what does it mean, a generic omega? It means that if you take this ratio, so it's, uh, it's maximized for a certain uh, gamma naught, And uh, and you have um, okay, a weak form of non-degeneracy for the for the maximum. That means that if you are much far away from gamma naught in a certain uh, weak norm, uh, then uh, the value of the ratio is less than the maximal value minus a certain number alpha, which you can take as a which can be as small as you like, uh, times the, the distance to a power beta, which can be as large as you like. Okay, so, uh, so in, in fact, uh, we did prove that uh, if you take a norm that will be far than the distance, in the sun, that uh, there are other examples. Uh, but then we want to go uh, even further than that. So, so now we have to look closely at the interaction field. So, so for for this uh, for this result, yeah, you can look at the interaction terms in a very uh, very weak way. You don't really have to, to go into it in, in detail. But if you want to go further, well, you you have to. These uh, interaction terms. So, if you're in two D, filaments are just uh, points, right? And if you have two vortices at point A and one at point A, then the interaction is minus pi of the distance of A to B. So something in the okay, so logarithmic interaction. Is that true? I always assume here that the vortices have a degree uh, plus one, right? This is the case for minimizers. In 3D, of course, it's more complicated, right? Because uh, then you don't have points, but you have filaments. And, uh, and of course, uh, okay, describing the interaction of this is, uh, is maybe uh, more uh, problematic. Um, uh, but you have this uh, work of Contreras Gerard. Uh, so here, Uh, we deal with a nearly parallel case. So, so what they proved in a, in a very uh, rigorous way is that uh, if you, okay, the magnetic field is that if you have a certain axis, straight axis here, and so you assume that you have filaments which are close to this uh, axis. So they are a graph over this axis. Uh, with A and B uh, small, 
okay so it's really a of t and b of t but but they you uh, okay but they're small and then the interaction term uh, can be written simply as the 2d interaction but integrated uh, with respect to t so this would be to leading order the, the interaction so maybe i should be more precise about what they prove so they set up a variational problem for which they are so it's on a cylinder right and you put a boundary condition on the top and bottom and a lateral part of the cylinder but on the top and bottom you have two vortices uh, which are uh, which are close and on the bottom you have two vortices which are close also and so they're able to prove that the minimizers okay so their curves they, they have filaments which are curves connecting these two vortices that they stay close to the axis and that the the shape of the curve uh, depends on the minimizing a certain energy which involves this interaction term so it's a it's a very nice result and um, and it really inspired us in in particular they uh, uh, they use a technique of an anisotropic uh, blow up which is uh, okay which is very uh, a very nice idea So now I will describe uh, our uh, result. So we okay we define this ratio to be uh, this quantity here, and uh, we make some assumptions. So the first assumption is a non-degeneracy assumptions. So we assume this ratio attains its maximum at a unique uh, gamma naught. Okay, and moreover, we assume that if you can, okay, if you consider the this ratio as a function of uh, u, so so you deform gamma naught uh, by uh, by an x one and pi. Okay, and uh, so so you take a, a vector u which is uh, okay, let's say in h one. Uh, of zero L with values in R3. So L is the length of gamma naught, right? And uh, it satisfies the condition that it's orthogonal to gamma naught at every point. Okay, so that's a way to deform gamma naught. And uh, you take R as a function of this deformation and you assume that it's second derivative. So its first derivative will be zero because uh, gamma naught is a maximizer, but it's second derivative. You assume that it's definite negative. All right. So again, this should be, uh, this should be generic uh, thing, but uh, you have to prove that. And uh, so the second derivative, you write it as minus Q of U, where Q is positive definite. So it's positive definite on H1. All right. So then uh, you take an applied field, which is a constant times Okay, and then And it's 21 plus, so in the, it's in the writing. Uh, but uh, hopefully, uh, what we prove is um, if we have no surprises, no surprises uh, during the writing, is that as epsilon goes to zero, minimizers of, um, of the Ginzburg Landau energy, okay, so they will have a, a number of filaments. Is, uh, which depends on omega k, the strength of the applied field. Uh, these filaments, okay, if you write them in this way, so it's gamma naught plus a certain uh, deformation. So, of course, you can always write it in this way. So, the question is, did you choose the right uh, scale here? Uh, and the answer is that yes, this is the right scale in the sense that if you write it if you write these filaments in this way, then, uh, then the ui epsilon do converge, something which belongs to h1. So I don't mean that the convergence in h1, I mean that the limit is in h1. And the 
convergence is uh, it's much weaker. In, in fact, the UI epsilon, the deformation, uh, does not even need to be a graph. So you have the gamma here. Uh, wait. So you have gamma naught. You will have filaments which are close to gamma naught. Um, well, that's because of this uh, non-degeneracy condition, right? Uh, the, wh when you're close to the first critical field, the filaments have to be close in, to gamma naught. Otherwise, we, they will not be nearly optimal for the ratio, but you, you could have things like that. So if you want, UI epsilon uh, could be uh, multi-valued. But, uh, but in the limit, you do get a true legitimate H1 graph over gamma naught. And, uh, and these graphs, these limiting graphs, are determined uh, by uh, the minimization. And uh, of course, for any value of the constant C you choose, you will get a limit. But if you choose uh, this C appropriately, uh, then the, the limiting energy, which is minimized by the graph, is the sum as I recall, is minus uh, the second derivative uh, of the ratio and these uh, 2D interactions. So here I cheated a little bit. Uh, this expression is valid only if gamma naught is, is a straight line. So in the case of the ball, if not, uh, you, have a, you have a weight here. Um, okay, so it's a, it's a bit more complicated because um, in the case of a curved uh, gamma naught. So, but, but I wrote it like this anyway. And um, okay, thank you so much, Etienne. Now, questions? ask the question about the last sentence of the talk. So can you tell us uh, what it looks like when gamma naught is not straight? Uh, yes, okay, so when gamma naught is not straight, um, okay, well, the, the, the thing is, okay, you, I will draw a thing, if I can erase, no, I cannot erase. Um, so I will draw things uh, here. So you, you have a gamma naught which is not straight. And uh, so you, you sort of slice things, right? And uh, so, so you get a, a plane here, but on the plane you have a metric. Okay, when you integrate things, you have a metric which is uh, given by the, the thickness of the slice, if you want. Okay? So you consider this plane, but with a weight on the plane. And then you're going to compute the, the renormalized energy, if you want, on a plane, but with a different metric. So I cannot really uh, make this explicit, but... Um, so, so you mean you, you take the, instead of, uh, so log, log of modulus is the fundamental solution of the Laplacian? Yes, that's right. And, and so you're saying I take not the fundamental solution of the Laplacian, but of uh, Laplacian with a conductivity, a minus nabla, uh, some function nabla? No, no, I take the, I take the fundamental solution of the Laplacian, but uh, with a different metric on the on the plane. Uh, is it just what I said? Uh, ah, that's I, what you said. Okay, okay. I, I, no, I'm wondering. I'm wondering. Can I can't uh, I just write this as a? <coughs> my, you, you know, I, I add a, a matrix. Uh, uh, the Laplacian is just two uh, two gradients. It's a gradient dot gradient. Ah, okay, okay, okay. And in between, I put I stick in a, a function, non a, a non constant function. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's, so yeah that's more, more more or less than that. That yeah. uh, that's it. 
the the thing is, uh, yes, if 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 you have a curved uh, gamma node, then you need to. Um, I mean, you, you need to work in different coordinates, which are uh, which are convenient. So, in in fact, the the way we do it is that we take uh, a little neighborhood of gamma naught, okay, and uh, instead of looking at these original coordinates, we take coordinates where this neighborhood is just a cylinder, yeah, okay. okay, and gamma naught is a straight line in the middle. And then we compute things like that. So everything is computed uh, with a different metric on this cylinder, of course. And so you get a different uh, renormalized energy uh, on the slices. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Nicola. Now, Jakob? Hey, yeah, thank you very much, Etienne. Uh, fortunately, your uh, slides were, were uh, very nice and clear because I could only hear about uh, one half of what you said. <laughs> was, uh, Sorry about that. Uh, but this is, uh, of course, a very, very interesting subject. And I wonder, uh, there is uh, certainly lots of uh, on the non-rigorous side uh, and even maybe experimentally. But I'm wondering, uh, for instance, uh, is it possible to have closed filaments? And uh, the topology, can you have filaments that, so to say, interlace like this? Uh, okay, so that's a, that's a very, uh, very interesting question, in fact, because uh, you, could, um, you could ask the question, for instance, for this ratio that was, I was talking about, when is, the, when is the supremum attained? So, in fact, I have a conjecture uh, and Okay, a tentative proof that uh, it is attained if and only if the supremum among closed curve is strictly less than the supremum. Uh -huh. If you have a gap between the, all right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So that would, that, if that was true, it would mean that the hypothesis of our theorem exclude uh, the case where gamma naught could be a, a closed curve. Gamma naught would yeah. If, the, if this is satisfied, then it means that if the, if the supremum is attained, it's necessarily attained by a, by a curve which goes from one end to the bound, of the boundary to another. Okay, but this is a conjecture still. Uh, yes, yes, it's a, it's a bit more than a conjecture, but uh, <laughs> yeah, let's say it's a conjecture. Okay, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jacob. Now we are waiting for more questions. But can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm confused with the notation. Um, you use the U with arrow. Is this U I assume still uh, the order parameter, the complex value function? Oh, no, no. You're absolutely right, Shinbin, because uh, this is very bad notation. No, no, this U is just for the curves. It has nothing to do with the order parameter. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes. So may I ask a question, a quick one? Yes, yes. Uh, no, it's just a curiosity about the, the role of the constant C in this last uh, statement. So mm -hmm. it's just a scale. Uh, well, it's just a constant actually, depending only on the domain, uh, and but there is also dependence on uh, on k. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's right. Okay. It, it depends also uh, on k. So, of course, of course, if you choose different constants, you will get a different uh, form of the limiting energy, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay, so in fact, you you will, if you choose a different value of the constant, you will get uh, just a moment. You 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 will get a certain uh, coefficient here. That's the only difference. Okay. Okay. And the coefficient will depend effectively on uh, omega and k. Okay. So I, I just chose c here because, so, so that I didn't need to write this coefficient uh, here. So it's, it's a scale of the energy. So the yeah, that's right. It, okay. Yeah, Thanks. exactly. Okay. It's explicit. 
So, more questions? Hi, hey, Etienne. So, I have a question. Um, I didn't understand whether uh, these, uh, uh, your mm, kind of somehow strict stability condition on the translation uh, has been proved in the U translation, uh, you proved uh, on the ball. Um, I'm not sure about that, <laughs> in fact. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure we proved it. Uh, I, I don't think so. Uh, we do have uh, examples where it's satisfied, uh, which are a bit trivial. Uh, so it's the case where uh, you would have, uh, for instance, uh, a cylinder. So. In the case where you have, um, make a drawing. So if you have uh, something like that, for instance, so and gamma not uh, like this, then it will be satisfied. So, or or if you take the if you take the, the ball, but you just flatten things uh, here, so you cut a little piece, so so the boundary is flat. Uh, then it will be uh, satisfied, but it's a, it's a little bit uh, ad hoc. And in the case where the, so, so you see the, the thing is you have a, a competition. Uh, let me explain maybe uh, the, uh, this, uh, this ratio. So if you have a curve, okay, so the magnetic term is a circulation of B naught, but if you integrate, uh, if you use a Stokes uh, theorem, so in fact, it will be the flux of B naught on uh, this surface, right? And uh, and the other term is the length. So in the case of the ball, for instance, you have gamma naught, which is like that. So clearly it maximizes the flux, uh, but for the length, uh, you, you could imagine deformations, which are like this, for instance. So this, will, this would reduce the flux, mm -hmm. which is not good but it would also 